Hey lore lovers, my name's Eric with the Lorebrarians YouTube channel, and today we're going to take a study in fire by exploring the history and nature of dragons throughout Magic the Gathering's multiverse. Dragons are a marquee creature in any fantasy world, inspiring both awe and fear in those who cross paths with them. They are sources of mystical enlightenment, primal carnage, and airborne majesty, and the multiverse is replete with these magical beasts. Dragons are present on many planes, and they are as different from each other as the territories are from which they reign. Dragons take on many divergent characteristics and appearances depending on the plane and even on the chronological time period. Some command world-shaking and immeasurable power, some toil in their caverns and roosts, collecting untold fortunes. Some bring heat and rage to their enemies in a molten inferno. Still, there are many things that all dragons have in common, in part due to their shared origins. They are all reptilian in appearance with large wings to sustain them in flight. They have formidable physical strength and many are quite intelligent. Most are attuned to magic, and parts of their bodies are believed by many cultures to have magical properties. Additionally, all seem to have an innate ability to breathe fire, and all command a threatening reputation for destruction. They are feared by every being but the most foolish, and even other powerful creatures give wide berth to a dragon in flight. Not every dragon is created equal, however, and there is a natural hierarchy predicated on the strength and abilities a dragon has. The top of the food chain is dominated by the Elder Dragons. These primordial beings were the supreme force on the plain of Dominaria nearly 25,000 years ago, and commanded world-shaking power. The only two currently alive are the twin planeswalkers Ugin and Nicol Bolas. Below them are the primeval dragons of Dominaria, five beings who combined their powers to unlock their truly devastating potential and had abilities that nearly rivaled their progenitors. Next are the Elder Dragons of Tarkir, Although they share a creature type, these elder dragons are not the same as those seen on Dominaria. Regardless, they are beings over 1,000 years old, and each presides over a subjugated clan on the plane. Then there is the Hellkite. Hellkites are similar to regular dragons in most respects, save for one important difference. They have an aggressiveness, a savage desire for destruction, and a hunger that can never be sated. They have the most fearsome personalities of all dragons, if not always the power to back it up. Below them is the standard dragon, the most common in the multiverse. Dragons are always a force to be reckoned with and hold top positions in their plane's food chain. Next we have the whelp. Immature dragons that have yet to reach their prime in life, whelps are fragile as most infants are. Still, the innate abilities develop early and their way of playing is an allusion to the capabilities they will wield once mature. At the bottom of the hierarchy is the drake. Thought to be a relative of the dragon, drakes have smaller, slender bodies and usually lack front legs. Associated most commonly with blue mana, the drake is seen as a pitiful insult to what the dragon stands for, and many are hunted to near extinction by dragons that prowl the skies. With the power level laid out, we can begin a thorough discussion on the origins and natures of dragons across the multiverse. I want to make it clear that this is by no means an exhaustive list of every dragon on every plane in the multiverse. Rather, it's highlighting areas and histories where dragons have been influential. I also want to note that this will not deeply explore the stories behind characters, events, and topics that have enough lore content to be covered by entire videos in their own right. Rather, this should act as a traveler's guide to the general principles surrounding dragons in the multiverse. From the mountains of Shiv to the molten peaks of Akum to the sulfurous forests of Jun, we'll explore similarities, differences, and much more as we learn about the dragons of Magic the Gathering. Let's dive in. Dominaria is thought to be the nexus of the entire multiverse, so it makes sense that our tour begins on this legendary plane. In negative 20,000 AR, or nearly 25,000 years from the present, the progenitor of all dragons swept across Dominaria, the Ur-Dragon. The Ur-Dragon is the essence of dragonkind throughout the multiverse, an avatar from the dawn of time that resides within and across the blind eternities, and even within the very fabric of reality, for its presence and its force can be felt across the plains. If we pull up the art for the card Ur-Dragon, we can truly see how massive its physical manifestation is, as it is described to have wings that spread across eternity, a presence that stirs the cosmos, and claws that can tear through ether. The beat of its wings charges magical storms that roll across each plane it visits, and from these storms its children are born. This is how the dragons of nearly all planes are believed to be created, but most importantly it is how the elder dragons of Dominaria came into existence. Hatching fully formed and with a developed consciousness from the cosmic eggs that fell from the Ur-Dragon, the elder dragons landed on Dominaria and quickly subjugated the local inhabitants. With powers that rivaled pre-mending planeswalkers, the Elder Dragons cut swaths of territory to claim as their own, easily burning, oppressing, 
or devouring any being that would stand in opposition. It's unclear exactly how many Elder Dragons existed at the height of their power, but the great empires they built would soon come crashing down. Beings of nearly infinite power cannot peacefully coexist in a finite space. The dragon's savagery and lust for power culminated in all-out conflict amongst their ranks, known as the Elder Dragon War. Several prominent broods of dragons spurred to action by the whispers and machinations of a young Nicol Bolas fought against one another tooth and claw. The war ravaged much of Dominaria and lasted nearly 4,000 years. In its aftermath, only seven Elder Dragons remained. These would become the only Elder Dragons remembered through history. The siblings Palladia Moors, Arcady Sabbath, Chromium Rule, Nicol Bolas, Ugin, and their cousins Vivictus Osmati and Piru. The victors of the terrible Elder Dragon War, they solidified their claim by stripping their foes of their lands, titles, powers, and even wings. The dragons throughout the rest of Dominaria's history can be traced back to the legendary Elder Dragons. The second generation of dragons were known as the Primevals, and they inherited much of their parents' power. Only five are known by name, Darigaz, Rith, Treva, Dromar, and Croesus. They each represent one aspect of the Ur-Dragon, which we can see in the flavor text of their golem attendants, and their draconic names each hearken to a stage in the life cycle. Darigaz means conception, and he is the breath of the Ur-Dragon. Also called the Igniter, his powerful fire burned away countless foes. Rith means childhood, and she represents the claw of the Ur-Dragon. Also called the Awakener, Rith's breath was capable of creating explosive growth of flora wherever it touched. Treva means youth, and she represents the voice of the Ur-Dragon. Also called the Renewer, her blinding white breath was known to cut through steel. Dromar means adulthood, and he represented the wings of the Ur-Dragon. Also called the Banisher, Dromar's breath created a shockwave that sent foes flying and fried artifacts with an electromagnetic pulse. Croesus means death, and he represents the eye of the Ur-Dragon. Also called the Purger, Croesus has a unique and powerful ability called the Word of Death. By merely speaking the word, any who heard it would perish. Due to this and his power over death, Croesus may have been the most powerful of the primeval dragons. The primevals ruled Dominaria after the Elder Dragons until they were defeated and imprisoned by powerful mages known as the Numena. They would remain this way for nearly 20,000 years until the dragon Ramadarigaz, the reincarnation of Darigaz, learned of his ancestry and awakened his slumbering siblings. To free Croesus from his prison, the other primevals sacrificed themselves, and with his mastery over death, he revived them all to their former glory, seen in the card Primeval's Glorious Rebirth. Each primeval represents a color of mana and aspect of the Ur-Dragon, and each has an associated charm and land. A plane-shifted and color-shifted cycle of the primevals was represented in the Planar Chaos block, but it isn't known from which reality they came, or to which they ended. It's interesting to note that the primevals are more closely related to the Ur-Dragon than the Elder Dragons, who were its initial offspring. In the present day, dragons are still a force on Dominaria, although their time of total domination has since passed. The dragons that exist are not as powerful or as intelligent as their primeval and elder predecessors, but they still command respect and strike fear in the inhabitants of the plain. The volcanic island of Shiv is home to the largest number of dragons on Dominaria, and they are the most fierce. These dragons have an intelligence to match other humanoid species, and many are attuned to spellcasting. They strike enemies swiftly and mercilessly, traveling across the continent in familial broods. A famous brood of Shivan dragons is the Bladewings, with some of its more notable members being Rorix and Tarix. Each dragon brood jockeys for power and influence among other dragons in hopes of claiming the title Champion of Shiv. The fire breath of Shivan dragons may be the most potent in the multiverse. The sulfurous landscape of Bogarden and the Burning Isles is another bastion of dragons on Dominaria. Its huge reserves of red mana fuel the hellkites that terrorize its skies. Other dragons exist across Dominaria and across the colors of mana. White-aligned alabaster dragons once soared above Argive. Green-aligned dragons can be seen populating the canopies of the Croson and Wanvuli jungles, and a most interesting breed of cat dragon called Nekaru populate the island of Madara and parts of Jamura. Their most notable member was the old queen of the Nekaru, Wasitora. Across the millennia and across the plain, dragons have shaped much of Dominaria's history and continue to be a powerful force in shaping its future. The dragons on Dominaria are perhaps the most varied in the multiverse, taking on many forms and aligning themselves with all colors of mana.
Although Dominaria can boast some of the most powerful and divergent dragon species, nowhere are dragons woven into the very fabric of the plains being than on Tarkir. When the elder dragon planeswalker Ugin set out across the multiverse, he visited the plain of Tarkir and brought with him the aura of the spirit dragon. Ugin's mere presence on the plain created vast maelstroms of raw energy that swept across the landscape of Tarkir, and from them emerged fully formed broods of dragons that took on the characteristics of the terrain they were born into. This phenomena is illustrated in the cards Dragon Tempest and Fearsome Awakening. There was a tentative balance between the dragon broods and the humanoid clans of Tarkir, mediated by the spirit dragon. But when Ugin was confronted and killed by his twin brother Nicol Bolas, his magic was no longer felt across the plain. Maelstroms dissipated, no new dragons were formed, and the power of dragons began to decline. They were summarily hunted to extinction by the Khans of Tarkir and their powerful clans, their bones the only thing that remained. The clans revered the extinct dragon as a symbol of power and identity, and each clan represented an aspect of the dragon. The Abzan embodied the dragon's endurance, the Jeskai its cunning, the Sultai its ruthlessness, the Mardu its speed, and the Timur its savagery. These ideals preserved the memory of Tarkir's dragons as their bones withered into dust. That is, until the planeswalker Sarkhan Vol, led by whispers of the long-dead Ugin, traveled to Ugin's nexus and journeyed back 1,000 years into Tarkir's past, where he preserved the fallen spirit dragon in a hedron cocoon to sleep and recover from his wounds. This rather pivotal moment created a shift in the timeline that would have massive repercussions for the dragons of Tarkir. In this new timeline, the maelstroms created by Ugin's presence didn't die out, but were in fact amplified. This led to a proliferation of dragons that the clans of old could not survive. Five particular dragons and their broods came to prominence during the period of war between Khans and dragons. They are Atarka, Dromoka, Kuligan, Ojitai, and Silumgar. The five dragons led their broods to victory over the humanoid clans in a moment that would be named the Khan Fall. Fast forward 1000 years to the present day of the new timeline, and dragons once again dominate the skies of Tarkir. The five dragon leaders are still very much alive and are now known as dragon lords. Similar to the primevals of Dominaria, the dragon lords each embody an aspect of the dragon, and they have integrated the humanoid species of the plane into their new clans. An interesting point to make is that all five of the dragon lords have the creature type Elder Dragon, a type we've not seen on a card since the Elder Dragons of Dominaria's ancient past. A clear distinction must be made, however. Even though the Dragon Lords carry the title of the Elder Dragon, it doesn't bear the same meaning as the Dominarian Elder Dragons. They're powerful, but they don't command the world-shaking abilities that the original Elder Dragons possessed. This title is just used to signify that the Dragon Lords are very old, over 1,000 years old, and are among the oldest beings on Tarkir. Dragon Lord Atarka represents the claw of the dragon and its savagery. She is a massive dragon bristling with antlers and spikes, and has an insatiable hunger a desire to feed that drives her. Atarka and her brood prefer to hunt in the frigid wilderness of the Kalsisma mountain range, and she rules over her clan from its peaks. Her savagery and bestial nature are reflected in other dragons from her brood, who bask in the thrill of the hunt and gorge on the subsequent feast. They are amongst the most physically formidable dragons, and most are known to breathe green fire. Dragonlord Kolagan represents the wing of the dragon and its speed. In stark contrast to Clan Atarka, Kuligan dragons live only for the thrill of the hunt and the kill. They care little for feasting or enjoying the spoils of victory before moving on to their next quarry. Kuligan is the most agile of dragons and sports four feathered wings that are capable of carrying her anywhere in a moment's notice. The dragon lord is seen as feral and fickle. She dispenses praise and judgment how she sees fit and is the only dragon lord that does not speak the draconic language, preferring to communicate with violent shows of aggression. Kuligan is wreathed in electrical storms and her brood breathes lightning rather than fire. The dragons of clan Kuligan are unmatched in their speed and their cruelty. They strike swiftly, taking what they want when they want, with no law, code, or honor to keep them in check. Dragon Lord Dramoka represents the scale of the dragon and its endurance. Dramoka and her brood reside in the harsh deserts of the shifting wastes, enduring under sweltering heat and harsh conditions. Unlike most other dragon lords, Dramoka has built a true community that fosters cooperation and growth between its dragons and non dragonoid members. Dramoka and her dragons are seen defending or working in tandem with those who revere them, using their massive scaly bodies and white hot breath to protect their clan. Those who distinguish themselves in Clan Dramoka are rewarded with a dragon scale from the dragon lord or her scale lord counterparts. 
The clan values unity above all, and this close-knit relationship is what allows Dromoka and her followers to outlast the harshest of conditions. Dragonlord Ojitai represents the eye of the dragon and its cunning. He uses his ageless insight and peerless intellect to lead his brood and followers to a higher level of wisdom. Ojitai is a slender, feathered dragon with superb martial prowess and knowledge. Known as the Great Teacher, he spends countless hours in meditation and imparts his insight to his followers. Ojitai dragons are acrobatic, graceful, and solitary. The greatest among them are known as Skywises, and they dispatch foes with effortless aplomb. Dragons of Ojitai's brood are distinguishable by their feathered appearance and their unique frost breath. They make their roosts in high mountain peaks where their humanoid followers build shrines, temples, and training grounds to learn all that the great teacher has to offer. Dragonlord Silimgar represents the fang of the dragon and its ruthlessness. He is the embodiment of greed using cunning, treachery, and vile machinations to accrue vast amounts of wealth, filling treasure troves to the brim with glistening artifacts and precious metals. Silumgar resides in an opulent palace deep within the Sagu jungles, where he rules over the dragons of his brood and a massive contingent of undead servants. Silumgar dragons are known for their cruel and merciless nature, lying and betraying to advance themselves and gather more personal influence. They're capable of spewing acidic breath and noxious fumes, choking and corroding anything within the vile clouds. They are also adept at necromancy and use their powers to maintain undead servants and household guards. Silumgar is the most conniving and ruthless dragon among his brood. As such, he is also the most paranoid about losing his position of power. He frequently isolates himself, descending into raving fits of paranoia, worried that Kulagan and her brood, or any other dragon for that matter, could be his undoing. The dragons of Tarkir were influential to its history and culture in both timelines. They are a varied race and encompass all five colors of mana. Fierce and magnificent, dragons now dominate the future of Tarkir. Abundant across the shifting sands, the mountain peaks, and the jungle swamps, no other plane in the multiverse is as synonymous with dragon as Tarkir is. The Shard of Jund on the plane of Alara lacks reserves of blue and white mana. It has long since thrown off the chains of order and deliberation these colors represent in favor of the raw, unadulterated power the remaining colors offer. In a world where the only truth is that the strong survive and the weak are consumed, only one creature is ferocious and savage enough to claim the mantle of Apex Predator, and that creature is the dragon. The sharp volcanic peaks and steaming jungles that dominate the topography of Jund are the perfect hunting grounds for dragons, whose own temperament and lethal power mirrors the landscape. The dragons of Jund are similar to others in that they are fiercely territorial and aggressive in expanding their hunting grounds. They frequently come to blows with one another in an attempt to gain more areas to feed. Without blue or white mana, the dragons of Jund are less intelligent than some other dragon races and have little in terms of forethought or structure. Their only language is heat and destruction, and they are master linguists. Jund dragons are worshipped as gods by the goblins that populate the shard, and the mechanic Devour illustrates perfectly how many goblins sacrifice themselves to appease their gods and how voracious the dragons of the shard truly are. The dragons of Jund are perhaps the most formidable of their kind in the multiverse. The ultimate dragons of Jund are known as overlords, brutally efficient and destructive hellkites that consume with practiced ease. The most powerful of these is a dragon known as Karthus, the tyrant of Jund, who displays enough power that even other dragons obey for fear of their lives. Overlords can live to be quite old, due partly to their ability to regenerate from harmful wounds as seen on the card Hellkite Overlord. When a dragon does reach their final days, they hurl themselves into an active volcano in a ritual called the Shriek of Flame. This causes the volcano to erupt and reduce the original dragon's territory to ash, one final act of territorialism to prevent others from taking the land. There is one Alaran dragon known to exist outside of Jund, and that is the demon dragon known as Malfagor, who resided on the Shard of Grixis. With the conflicts of Alara and reconnection of the shards, dragons have left Jund to lay claim to new realms beyond the horizon. The only card to illustrate this migration from Jund is Spellbound Dragon, where a ferocious beast has had its mind broken and is now at the command of Esper Mages. Not a great foreshadowing for the future of these powerful and fanatic creatures. The dragons of the city plain of Ravnica have an ancient and storied past much like those of Dominaria. 
In fact, it's believed that in the early days of Ravnican history, their dragons were nearly as powerful as the Elder Dragons and shared much of their characteristics. They were born with a full consciousness and sense of self, and they had a magical connection to ancient knowledge. They warred with one another as well as other races on a scale similar to the Elder Dragon War and are described as having burned the world into being. Other ancient clans knew their power and inclination for wholesale destruction would be the death of Ravnica, and so when they created the Guild Pact, they included magic that was used to defeat or weaken many of the dragons. Thousands of years later, dragons are still fierce and terrifying, although they are quite rare to be seen in the wilds. Niv-Mizzet, Perun of the Izzet League, is arguably the most powerful dragon on the plane. He has a genius-level intellect, and his prowess with magic is second to none. He sees others of his kind as primitive but formidable adversaries, and has spent hundreds of years hunting them to near extinction. The dragons of Ravnica make their roosts in the spires of the city or at the edges of civilization. Some are kept by the cult of Rakdos for pit fighting, some soar above the city skyline, and others, like the Utvara Hellkite, reside just beyond the city's reach. In contrast to the graceful and abundant dragons on Tarkir, Innistrad dragons are brutally swift, making appearances in a flash to devour their prey before retreating back into the darkness, and they are quite rare. The flavor text of Archwing Dragon and Balefire Dragon give us a clear vision of their temperament. Most dragons create lairs or roosts in the mountainous region of Gaia Reach and seem to have a lower level of intelligence than dragons on other planes. A dragon will hunt whatever strays into its territory, but some have developed a taste for vampire and werewolf blood, making them tentative allies to the humans of the plane. Moonvale and Mirrorwing Dragons, named for the way their wings capture the moon's light, are seen as good omens as they soar in the night sky. Perhaps the most unique of all dragon species are those found on the plain of Kamigawa. That's because they are spirits first and foremost, not living, breathing dragons. They have neither wings nor legs and take on a serpentine appearance as they flit through the skies. There are five spirits, or kami, that have taken the form of the dragon. Each is associated with a specific color of mana, and each has been sworn to protect a region of the physical realm. Yosai, the morning star, guards Iganjo. Yugan, the rising star, protects the Jukai forest. Kiga, the tide star, watches over the school of Minamo. Ryusai, the falling star, guards the Sokenzan mountains. And Kakusho, the evening star, guards the Takanuma swamp. After Lord Konda stole the divinity from the most supreme kami, Okagachi, a war between the spiritual and physical realm erupted and lasted decades. During the Great Kami War, all five spirit dragons defied Okagachi by remaining true to their vows and protected the mortals. A majority of the spirit dragons were killed in the decades-long conflict, but since they aren't truly living, they did not remain defeated for long. It appears as though they can be resummoned from the spirit realm back to the physical world. Living dragons apart from the five spirit dragons are believed to exist on Kamigawa, but not much is known about them. There are numerous other planes that either the Ur-Dragon, Ugin, or other sources have populated. The following list and descriptions are by no means exhaustive, but give a brief detail of planes on which few dragons exist, or they don't play an integral role in shaping the plane. The Drifting Plane of Chandelar is home to many powerful dragons, but not much is known about their intellect or magical capacities due to their more reserved nature. They prefer to make their lairs far from civilization, especially in the mountainous regions of Valkas. The peaks of Valkas are home to territorial and fierce dragons. A unique dragon species called Astral Dragons also resides on Chandelar. Even less is known about them, but they are exceedingly powerful and capable of killing pre-mending planeswalkers, as was the case when Kenan Sarmal summoned one to destroy the planeswalker Farallon. The plane of Eldraine is divided into two distinct regions and cultures, the Realm and the Wilds. The realm is ruled by the High King and the courts of Eldraine, and is protected by valiant knights. The wilds are populated by fae and other magical beings, where danger and adventure are rife. The dragons of Eldraine reside in the wilds and make frequent incursions into the realm to add to their territories. What sets Eldraine dragons apart is that they are most closely associated with blue mana rather than red, suggesting cool intelligence and control over ice. Interestingly, some red cards depict dragons breathing fire, and there may be a subset of dragon that is more traditionally red-aligned. Across the multiverse, on the Greek-inspired plain of Theros, dragons fill the skies above the mountain peaks of the god Perforos' realm. Hoplites in the city-state of Akros revere the dragon as a force of beauty, aggression, and destruction, and it's believed that sparks from the god of the forge fills the belly of every dragon. 
Theron dragons don't express the higher form of intelligence that other species have. They are quite territorial and fierce. Most of the dragons are part of a brood whose lines trace back to Thraxes, a savage dragon of mythological power that rests in Perforos's peak. As is the case with Stormbreath dragons, some Theron dragons breathe lightning, similar to Colgan's brood on Tarkir. Ikoria, the lair of behemoths and plain notorious for monstrous creatures, beings of immense proportions and savage mutations, has the most ridiculously tiny dragons in the multiverse. These dragon sprites are the size of large insects, but much like a wasp, pack a considerable punch that belies their size. Unlike most other planes in the multiverse, the introduction of dragons to the metal world of Marodin was unnatural. The planeswalker Karn gave stewardship of his plane to an Urgolem warden named Memnarch while he traveled across the multiverse. After decades of isolation and corruption by the Phyrexian contagion, Memnarch sought to bring life to the cold, metallic world by creating countless soul traps, vessels capable of capturing beings from other worlds and transporting them to Marodin. This is how dragons came to populate its skies. Over centuries of evolution and interaction with a mysterious spore called Mycosynth, dragons became partially artificial in nature. Large sections of their bodies are metallic, and their stomachs look more like bellowing furnaces than anything else, illustrated in the cards Furnace Whelp and Furnace Dragon. As beasts with a capacity for fire breathing, dragons have found life on a metal world unchallenging, melting down any foe that would stand against them. Marodin dragons are intelligent, but not to the point of creating sophisticated language or social interactions. They take more pride in accruing vast amounts of scrap metal and treasure within their lairs, as is the case of Horde Smelter Dragon. Some dragons on Marodin are entirely artificial, as is the case with Steel Hellkite. These are more likely constructs of artificers than the next stage in dragon evolution on the plane. With the spread of the Phyrexian Contagion and the ensuing battle for Marodin, dragons found themselves on both sides of the conflict. Untainted dragons were valuable allies to the Mirren partisans, who could wipe out entire columns of Phyrexian attackers with their unrelenting fire. Those that succumbed to the glistening oil and were completed became known as Molten Steel Dragons, whose ire and destruction was greater than their counterparts. One such dragon was Scythrix, the Blight Dragon, a skeletal creature that resided in the Mephidros Swamp and acted to proliferate the Phyrexian Contagion, and ish saw the Vault of Whispers can be seen in the background of its art. Dragons soar through the sky surrounding the mountain peaks of Akum on the plain of Zendikar. A molten continent, Akum is saturated with red mana and the perfect habitat for the dragons of the plain. Most roost near the megavolcano Valakut, the molten pinnacle, flying down swiftly from the mountaintops to strike at nomads and hunt for food. The barbarian clan of Kargan worships the dragon, and some are trusted enough to ride atop the majestic beasts. The dragons of Kaladesh make their roosts in tall spires over the whirring city of Girapur, hunting sky whales, drakes, and skyship crew members as they soar through the ether sphere. Kaladeshi dragons are found mainly in the mountains outside Girapur, but some have chosen to nest in the vertical district of Freedom. Here, dragons have an appearance that represents furred jungle cats rather than the more traditional reptilian characteristics. And so ends our study in fire as we've explored the dragons of Magic the Gathering's multiverse. From the plane spanning Ur Dragon and ancient birth of dragons, to the spires of Ravnica, to the forbidden wilds of Eldraine and the bubbling streams of Ikoria, dragons are quite varied in appearance and capabilities, and are one of the most divergent and widespread creatures in the multiverse. Despite this, all dragons share a fierce, aggressive temperament, a capacity for destruction, and an aura of majesty that commands both respect and fear in those that cross their paths. Many also have a great capacity for greed, hoarding trinkets, treasures, and all manner of trophies to add to their opulence. This behavior can be seen in dragon species all across the multiverse. Their impact on planes to come and planes unknown will continue to shape the future of the multiverse and cultures that coexist with these powerful creatures. Thanks for watching. Leave a thumbs up if you liked the video and subscribe for more lore content. And now I want to hear from you. Let me know in the comments below your favorite dragons as well as suggestions of creatures you'd like to learn more about for future videos. I've linked the references used in the description below. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.